You don't seem to be happy about that. All right. And the senior pastor of Champions Arena International, right in Yaoundé, Cameroon. And then you also have the greetings from my church. They are watching now and they are praying also for the program. Esther chapter 5, 1 and 2. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. Give me some, please, drink. I'll be preaching this morning, uh, and then we'll pray. I'll preach short. I'm not going to teach. <laughs> and say so we can pray. Every time we are coming for a retreat or a camping, it's always in the spirit of prayer. And of necessity, it is difficult to talk about the tabernacle of David without the concept of prayer and the concept of glory. Now, we just read from the book of Esther, and please pay attention for the next few minutes, and then we'll pray. The theological division of the book of the Bible places the book of Esther as the last of the 12 historic books. Of course, you understand the division of the Bible in the Pentateuch, uh, the historical books, the poetic books, the prophetic, the New Testament, and the rest. And so in the historic books, Esther happens to be at the last, shortly before the beginning of the poetic books, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Sons of Solomon. What is more, the book of Esther is in, listen to me carefully please, I will talk very briefly and then we'll pray. And the book of Esther is in sandwich between two interesting books, namely the book of Nehemiah and the book of Job. On one hand, Nehemiah is the story of a rebuilder who faces a very unpleasant situation due to the degradation of the people he was called to lead the people of Israel. And that will push him to undertake a very interesting work, a high risk work in a typically hostile environment. And so he was in a risky environment and he engaged a risky work in a hostile environment. On the other hand, we have the book of Job, which happens to be the book of a God lover. Someone who loved God, who took the risk of love God, of loving God and defending the love he had for God with the last drop of his blood to the point where even the closest person to him, his own wife, turned to him and said, curse God and die. Do you still hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Somebody say risk. Oh, talk to me please. Say risk. Say that a little louder. Say risk. Turn to your neighbor and say, listen to my story. Please turn to three people and tell them, listen to my story. And so this interesting story of Esther is found, like I said, between Nehemiah and Job. And Job is a God's lover. In spite of the sarcasm, in spite of the shame, in spite of the challenges he faced and the rejection, not just from his friends, from his family and the rest, he will maintain his integrity, and that was a big risk Job is taking. And so the book of Esther is a bridge between the book of Nehemiah and the book of Job, who happen to be two books of high 
risk. You have Nehemiah who takes the risk of undertaking a great work for God in a risky environment. And you have the book of Job who shows a man who takes the risk of loving God at the cost of his life, at the cost of his relationships. And so if the book of Nehemiah is a book of risk, and the book of Job is a book of risk, and the book of Esther happens to be the bridge between the book of Nehemiah and the book of Job, what can be a, a bridge between two risks, if not a risk itself? And so that is suggesting that the book of Esther is of necessity a book of risk. And so it is from the beginning to the end, the story of people who took risks, positive risk and negative risk. It is the story of Queen Vasti, who takes the risk of declining an invitation from the king in a context where the respect of tradition was sacred and within an event where such an act was possible of judgment because it was considered as an abomination. It is the book or the story of a man called Mordecai who would take the risk of refusing to bow before the almighty prime minister Haman, thus ignoring the consequences which were attached to this visibly disloyal act strategically profound in God's agenda. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Touch your neighbor, say follow that man. Touch your neighbor, touch another neighbor, say follow that man. He's taking us somewhere. And so it is the story of a woman called Esther who to save her people from the cruelty of a man without respect will take the risk of presenting herself before the throne at a time where protocol forbade any visitation or any entry into the king's palace. And so with the few explanations that precede, you can understand that the book of Esther is a book of risk itself. So both by its strategic positioning as a book between two books of risk and from its contents of the various stories, you can understand that the book of Esther is a book of risk. Somebody say risk. Or oh, talk to me, please say risk. And so the book opens from chapter one with two disappointments. The first disappointment is the disappointment of Vasti who will turn down the king's invitation to come to him. Now, the two disappointments are related to the king. The first by Vasti, the second again by Vasti. Listen to my story. The very first disappointment is not that Vasti did not answer the king's invitation. No. The first disappointment was the reason why Vasti did not answer the king's invitation. Apparently, the first thing we see is Vasti did not answer the king's invitation. And the king was disappointed. Sure. But that wasn't the first level of disappointment. The first level of disappointment was that Vasti had forgotten who she was living for. The reason why she turned the king's invitation is that she had organized her own party. Bible student. So the first disappointment wasn't that she didn't answer the king's call. 
The first disappointment was that she had forgotten who she was living for. She was busy with her own feast. I am sure if Vasti was free, she would have answered the king's call. So the disappointment of the king was not that she didn't come. The disappointment of the king was that she had forgotten who she was living for. Oh, that God may give me the grace to drive this one thing in your spirit this morning so we can pray around it. Mm, the men that will grow, the men that will achieve great things with God, the men that will ascend to the throne of greatness, the men that will write their names in the annals of history with the kingdom, the men that will leave indelible marks on the sands of time, are the men who understand who they live for. And so sometimes we read the story of Vasti and we say, what a silly woman. How many of you have called her silly before? You don't need to raise your hand because all of us have done that. I raise my hand for all of us. We read the story and we say, what a stupid woman. How could Vasti do that? But we forget that in most cases, we adopt the same attitude most of us claims to be Esther's. But we are simply vasties in nature carrying the name of Esther. So we are vasties by nature and Esther by nomenclature. Vasti did not know who she was living for. The question I want to ask you this morning is who do you live for? I like your silence. I like your quietness. Help me turn to three people and ask them the question of who do you live for? Oh, come on, turn to three people. Turn to three people and ask them who do you live for? Now listen, so Vasti did not answer the king's invitation because Vasti did not know that she had changed levels. She did not know she had changed registers. Once upon a time she was in a register of people who could live their lives and do they are things, they are way. But now Vasti is no longer the little girl in the neighborhood who could wake up in the morning and go to where she wants, when she wants, and how she wants. No, Vasti, you are no longer the little girl who yesterday could wake up at any time and do anything. Now you are the king's wife. And as the king's wife, you don't do your things. You do the king's things. You don't take your action. You take the king's actions. You don't make your decisions. You make the king's decisions. You don't follow your will. You follow the king's will. So the king was disappointed because he realized that Vasti has not realized who she lives for. And in the kingdom of God, the men and the women who will achieve great things with God, the men and the women who will ascend to the heights of the kingdom, who will be said to have worked with God, are men and women who understood who they live for. They have understood they no longer live for themselves, but they live for the king. David understood it. And that is why one day he woke up and said, let God arise and let no, 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 and let 
Talk to me, please. And let uh -huh. you see, you see, let God arise and let my enemies be scattered. Mm -mm. David woke up one day and said, Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Scatter. This thing is choking me. I feel like preaching. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. David knows God enough to know that God does not have enemies because no man is powerful enough to be an enemy of God. No devil is devil enough to be an enemy of God. But David, who knows God enough, says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. David is actually talking about his enemies to him because he knows that God is too God to have enemies. But David understood that he lives for the king. And when you live for the king, your enemies become king. His enemies, your enemies become his enemies. So when David is talking, he's looking in front of him. Help me here. David is looking in front of him. He sees one enemy coming against him. He sees the second enemy coming against him. He sees the third enemy coming against him. But he says, let God arise. He says, let God arise but let his enemies be scattered. In other words, David knows that because I live for the king, these enemies are no more my enemies. They are his enemies. I came to tell somebody this morning, when you live for the king, your enemies become his enemies. When you live for the king, your challenges become his challenges. Your bills become his bills. Your difficulties become his difficulties. So I came to challenge somebody this morning. It is time for you to look at people and let them know. Ah, somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. I say shout hallelujah. And so you must come to that place where you know who you live for. Oh, go to three people and tell them, I live for the king. I live for the king. Go to three people. Go to three people. Go to three people and tell them, I live for the king. David knows what he's saying. You cannot say what David says said if you don't understand what David understood you can't just stand up listen to me that is why in most cases you say what David said but you don't have the result that David had because you are saying what David said without understanding what David understood without living at the level at which David lived so when you stand and say let God arise and let his enemies be scattered no enemy scatters why because before David could make that statement. He had something he's doing with God. He knew that his life is on the altar. He knew that he is a tabernacle for God. And because he is a tabernacle for God, his enemies have become of necessity the enemies of God. And that is why Paul could say in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ yet I live but not I but Christ that liveth in me Paul has understood that, that if I live now can I have a young man somebody come I need somebody come quickly let me do an illustration come 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 Paul has understood something now watch this everybody Paul says I am crucified with Christ therefore I live but not I that lives 
Christ that liveth in me. Because the life that I'm living now is the life of Christ. Listen to me. In the Roman Empire, when somebody dies because of you, mm, they crucify the person. And after crucifying the person, they take you who caused the death of the person. And they bring, look at me, please. And they bring you and they crucify you with the person. That was the tradition. They crucify you there with the person. That was your punishment when they realize that the person was crucified because of you. They take you there and they crucify you. You breathe the death of the person until you die. That was your punishment. Because after crucifying the person, they realized that this person died because of you. So they will take you to the place and crucify you also. And you will stay there and breathe that death until you die by the person's death. And this is what Paul is saying. We read it, we don't understand it. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, this man died. And when he died, they realized he died because of me. So they took me for my punishment and crucified me with him. So I can die by breathing his death. Just that in this case, this man that died, when I am breathing his death, his death is not giving me death. Query side. Where, where is query side? The difference is this. With the other people who have died, when I breathe their death, I end up dying. But in the case of Christ, when I... When I stay there, I am breathing his death. But when I breathe his death, his death does not give me death. His death gives me life. That is why Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. In the Roman Empire, when you were crucified with a man, you die. But Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, yet that's, that's what Paul is saying. That's why he says yet. Yet means I am not supposed to. That's the meaning of yet. Yet means I am not supposed to live. Because in normal circumstances, I am supposed to die. Yet, I am alive. But this life that I'm living is not my life. It is the life I collected from his death. Therefore, somebody must talk to the devil and tell him, I live for the king. All can do good to three people, give them high five. Say, I live for the king. Say, I live for the king. I said, he tell somebody. Tell somebody I live for the king. I have good news for somebody. I have good news for somebody. I have good news for somebody. When you live for the king, you can... Listen to me. Listen to me. When you live for... The, that is why Apostle Paul will say, we are dead and our lives are hidden with Christ in God because when I live for the king what cannot kill the king cannot kill me when I live for the king no sickness can kill me when I live for the king no accident can kill me when I live for the king no devil can destroy my life because the life that I live is not I that live but Christ that lives through me Ask your neighbor, 
who do you live for? I say, ask your neighbor, who do you live for? I just came to, I told you I'm not preaching, I'm not teaching. I was called to challenge you and ask you a question within the tabernacle so we can pray. I will teach you later. Ask somebody again, who do you live for? Who do you live for? Please, this is a serious question. Don't think you live for yourself. That is why the thing that happened to you happened to you. Because you are living for yourself like vasty. When the king invites you for fellowship, you are too busy. That is why we don't go to the king. We don't go to the king because we are busy with our own things. So we are not living for the king. We are living for ourselves. So you must take the challenge today and say, I live for the king. I live for the king. Money or no money, I live for the king. Marriage or no marriage, I live for the king. Ministry or no ministry, I live for the king. Uh, look, 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 look at what happened. I want us to pray at least 20 minutes. Look at, look at me everybody. And the story of Esther is the story of somebody who understood that living for the king is a risk. The reason we do not live for the king, Apostle Paul, is because we know that living for the king is a risk. It is the risk of praying five hours every day when other people's churches are growing. Your own is not growing. And he asks you to stay with him six hours every day. It's a risk. Can I talk to adults? It's a risk to be reading the Bible three hours every day and you don't see any result. Someone is just by you. He's not reading the Bible. He's not praying. But he's got a thousand members. He's got two thousand members. You don't see him praying. You don't see him fasting. You don't see him studying. But you see his church growing. And the king, and the king is telling you, oh my brother, bring this one. I prefer that one. Hey, this thing, this microphone's will my assignment must be fulfilled. Listen to me. It's a risk. Fellowshipping with the king is a risk. The risk of people telling you, you'll be praying for six hours in tongues. How far has your ministry gone? It's a risk of being through shame. And people ask you, since you married that man, and you say you're praying, you say you're studying, how far have you gone? It's a risk. It's a risk. Spending time with the king, answering the king's call, is a risk. Doing this is a risk. The story of Esther is the story of risk. Can I shock you? When she understood this, look at what God began to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to. I just wanted to share something and go. But you see, this thing has a way of coming. You don't know how to stop it. I want to pray for somebody this morning that you will be baptized with a fresh passion for risk. All the men who walked with God took risk because the first risk they took was to walk with God. How can you ask me to leave my father's house, to leave my land? Geographical suppression, cultural suppression, emotional suppression, three levels of suppression that God asked Abraham, leave your father's land, leave your kindred, leave your culture. Cultural suppression, emotional suppression, geographical suppression. How can you ask me three levels of suppression to go to where? And Abraham departed. Risk. The reason why many of you are still where you are in your growth, in your ministry, in your business, in your work with God is fear 
of risk. What you don't know is that life is all about risk. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To cry is to take the risk of being accused of being weak. To laugh is to take the risk of being accused of a mocker. Everything is risk. The Bible says, Esther said, fast three days. I will fast three days and I will go to the king's palace in spite of the law. Hey, God. Now, nah, sometimes this thing is like punishment. I will go to the king in spite of the law. In other words, there is a law that says you must not cross this threshold. But I, Esther, I have understood that for me to get to where I have to get with God, I must be ready to take risks. Listen to my story. That's the topic of my message for media department. I knew you would not be taking notes. It's a preaching. I wanted to preach a little so you can be geared up to pray. The topic is listen to my story. Esther is telling you my story is a story of risk. I will enter the king's palace in spite of the law. In other words, there is a law that says, Esther, you cannot cross this place. But I will enter there in spite of the law. Somebody holler, in spite of the law. No, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. Shout with me, in spite of the law. There are many laws in the realm of the spirit that have decided where your ministry must stop. There are many laws in the realm of the spirit that have decided where your preaching must stop. You make all efforts, but there is a law. You pray, but there is a law. You have fasted 40 days. You have fasted two years. But there is a law in the realm of the spirit that says you must not cross here. But Esther said, I know the secret to cross this place. I will take the risk of entering into the king's palace in spite of the law. I want to announce to somebody here, at the end of this conference, you will cross that level in spite of the law. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. It is in spite of the law. Do you know the meaning? Now, what we want, we want the Lord to be removed so we can move. Esther said, I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait for the law to be canceled. I will move in spite of the law. Some people here must succeed in spite of your ministry must move forward in spite you are not there. These, these are people who are following my message. I say your ministry must grow far in spite of the Lord. Somebody must talk to himself. I say I will move forward in spite of the law. I will succeed in ministry in spite of the law. I will succeed in business. In my marriage will succeed in spite of the law. My ministry will grow you will turn to the devil all the witches in the village and the wizards and you will talk to their face and tell them my ministry will succeed in I love I love this illustration about Moses and Jesus you know Moses got to the Red Sea and he says, Red Sea, open. The sea says, I'm not opening. Moses said, Red Sea, you must open so we can pass. The sea said, I'm not opening. Moses said, Red Sea, you must open so we can pass. Sir, the sea said, we are not opening. Until Moses had to do the gymnastic and smite the sea. And the sea opened. But there is another generation. The Jesus generation. He got to the sea. And say, see, open so I can pass. The sea said, I'm not opening. He said, see, open so I can pass. The sea said, I'm not opening. And Jesus said, I am not the Moses generation. 
that must wait for you to open. If you don't open, I walk on you. If you don't open, I walk on you. If you don't open, I walk on you. Look at somebody say, if the devil doesn't want to go, I walk on him. You must look at your enemy and tell the enemy, if you don't want to go, I walk on you. Sickness, you don't want to go, I walk on you. Listen to me. Moses could not cross the sea because the sea must open. Jesus walked across the sea in spite of the law that says you cannot walk on water. For you to walk on the sea, the sea must open. For Joshua to cross, the sea must open. But an upgraded version. Oh, look at somebody sound moving forward. In spite of the law, I'm not staying in one place. I will increase my prayer time. In spite of the law, I will increase my reading time. In spite of the law, I will increase my fasting. In spite of the law, I will increase my sacrifice. In spite of the law, I will increase my preaching. In spite of the law, somebody shout, in spite of the law. Yes! Somebody shout, yeah! I prophesy on one million people. In spite of the law, your church will cross 1,000. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? Who am I prophesying to? In spite of the law, your church will cross 5,000. In spite of the law, your church will cross 10,000. In spite of the law, your church will cross 50,000. In spite of the law, your marriage will be stable. In spite of the law, your business will expand. Shout in spite of the law. And Esther, Esther steps into the king's palace. The king looks at her. And the king, the king doesn't know what to do because Listen to me. In the tradition, in the tradition, oh Lord, please have this. It's my passport. It's getting wet. Listen, as I close, I wanted us to pray, but our time is going. Hey. At that time, you have to be invited by the king. Sir, if you are not invited by the king, you cannot have access to his court. Are you getting that? And it was the normal thing. It was the normal thing. Ay, 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 ay. Ma. This thing is burning, it's burning, it's burning in my... Can I drop this so we can pray? In those days, according to the cultures and traditions, you don't go to the king. The king summons you. You don't go to the king. The king invites you. That is why in the Gospels, the only of the four Gospels that says, that shows the direction in the relationship in those days is John. As you all know, there are many pastors and ministers here and we've been preaching that. The four Gospels have a way of presenting 
the first visitors of Jesus. Do you remember that? Matthew says the first visitors were wise men. True or false? And you know why. He wants to show the kingship of Jesus. So he presented the first visitors as being royal people because the wise men were from a royal caste. So Matthew will present the first visitors as wise men. Mark does not have that time because his gospel is an action gospel. Luke presents the first visitors of Jesus as shepherds. Listen carefully. Why? He wants to show the humanity of Jesus. So he focuses on the visitors of Jesus who were the symbol of humanity. Shepherds. While Matthew wants to present the royalty, so he presents the visitors who are the symbol of royalty. The Bible is not contradictory, it is complementary. Those who say it's a contradiction have not understood the scriptures. It's a compliment. But then, three of them or two present those who visited Jesus, who is God. John wants to show the divinity that we know. But what we have not realized is that John is the only gospel that doesn't show people going to Jesus. Because in those days, you don't go to the king. And because he wants to show Jesus as the king, he did not do like Matthew, who showed people who came to visit Jesus. He did not do like Luke, who showed people who came to visit Jesus. But John says, he came to his own. <laughs> Only two people understood it. Only two people. You see, that's my, sometimes, no, no. The wise men went. The shepherds went. But John wants to show that he is a king. So he doesn't show people that came. He rather says he came to his own. Because in those days, you don't go to the king. The king comes to you. Or the king invites you. So Esther knows that she cannot go to the king. The king can come to her or he can summon her. And that is the law. And that is why when David says, I am enter his courts people stopped him and said David you know you don't have the right to enter his courts he must summon you and David told them no I know the key to enter without being summoned I enter his court with the David did not just say I enter when he said, I entered the court, they said, David, did he call you? David said, so he didn't call me, but I have the key. He, called, he said, let me finish. I enter his court with thanksgiving and praise. Because I know that when I enter with thanksgiving and praise, he will wonder who is there entering without having been invited. They say, it's David, but David is dancing. They say, let him enter because he has the key. Now, listen. So David understood it, that you don't go to the king, the king comes to you. And Esther takes the risk of going to the king. Now the Bible says she had not entered there for 30 days. How many days? 30 days. Let me drop this. I'm watching my time. Why 30 days? Now the king has to send the scepter. Because if you have not been with the king for 30 days, there is a rupture of fellowship. If you have not gone to the king for 30 days in their tradition, if you have not gone to the king for 30 days, there is rupture of fellowship. That is the reason why it was like that in all the empires, sir. That is the reason why when the people in Daniel 6 decided that nobody should pray to another God, they told the king, write it, that nobody should pray to another God for 30 days. Sir, they knew that if Daniel does not pray for 30 days in the realm of the spirit, there is a rupture of fellowship. So Esther knows that she has not gone to the king for 30 days. And so she is afraid. What can I do now? And she decided to take the risk of entering into the king. And the king stretched her the scepter, which was reconnection. But the good news is this. 
We are no more in the generation of Esther where we have to wait for the king to summon us. Now, we don't have to wait for the king to call us because we don't go to the tabernacle. We are. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Lift up your voice and pray for one minute. My time is up. Pray for one minute. Pray for one minute. Lord, help me to take the risk of fellowship. Help me to take the risk of fellowship. The risk of going to you every day. The risk of going to you every day. Lord, help me to take the risk of going to you every day. I am ready to take the risk of fellowship. The risk of my assignment. The risk of my mission. My life has not moved forward because I have been afraid to take risk. Lift up your two hands, everybody, and pray for mercy. Mercy to be able to take risk for God. Esther took a risk. Mordecai took the risk of not bowing to Haman. Esther took the risk of entering the king's palace. Lift up your hands, lift up your voice, and pray with intensity. Lord, I am ready to take greater risk for you. I am ready to take greater risk. Some of you are afraid to organize a conference because you don't want to take the risk. Some of you are afraid to plant a church because you don't want to take the risk. Some of you are afraid to start the mission where God gave you because you don't want to take the risk. Where are the estates of God who are ready to take risk? The risk of fellowship, the risk of prayer, the risk of fasting. Yes, it's a risk to pray eight hours every day. After one year, no result. It's a risk to fast every month for seven days. After two years, no result. It's a risk to read books and not see results and continue. It's a risk. Grace, oh God. Open your mouth and cry for, to God in one minute. 